what Oswald Hamdi is trying to sell to Pointer in 1906. And Pointer says, I saw it last year in Paris. This is what he saw. This is what Oswald Hamdi exhibited in 1905 uh, uh, in, in Paris. Is it the same? No, and yet it's identical. It's exactly the same thing. You have the same, for somebody who doesn't really uh, 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 focus on detail, it's the same thing, one oriental in red in an oriental uh, uh, framework, uh, one oriental in yellow in yet another oriental. That there were turtles or not is a point of detail. This, I think, is a very telling, almost Freudian explanation for the fact that he kept repeating the same kind of uh, representation of Islam, uh, which to the normal Western audience was simply identical. All said the same thing. And this is something that he practices. When you look at one of the costumes of his famous album that he presented <coughs> at the 1873 Vienna exhibition, uh, Costumes of the Ottoman Empire, this is a Kurd uh, from Anatolia. This is Oswald Hamdi himself in, Par in Vienna using the same costume and going to the photographer to play Oriental. This is the Persian trader, the Persian figure in 1905, who's using, again, the same costume. And of course, when you look at the turtle charmer, or whatever you want to call him, you can see that the basis for the costume, and especially the headgear, is exactly the same. He's constantly repeating over and over again the same kind of decorative elements, either in costume or in the setting. So, what's interesting is to realize that his turtle painter, his turtle charmer, contrary to what people have claimed, has no meaning whatsoever that concerns Ottoman modernization or incapacity. I have proof, again, of a letter he wrote to his, his father in 1869 in, in Baghdad. It says, Father, thank you so much for the volume of Le Tour du Monde, the National Geographic of the time, French version, that you sent me. And that volume, the 1869 volume, on page 420 whatever, has this representation of a Korean turtle charmer in, uh, in, in Japan. It's fascinating. What this is, what he's made, is a translation of a painting, of a, an engraving he, he saw and he thought was interesting. He translates it into an Ottoman, the Korean monk becomes an Ottoman dervish, a, a, a Muslim dervish, the turtles are there, and the rest can be adapted. And that's why people never understood what were the turtles of sim, a symbol of. They were a symbol of nothing. He was just reproducing, adapting, translating, something that he, and this, I think, is much more human and much more interesting than trying to find a message uh, behind each of his uh, paintings. I'll give you another, again, proof of how he worked. Three of his paintings, the turtle, whatever, the, uh, this is, nobody knows what it is called because it was never exhibited, so people call it two women uh, uh, in front of a mosque and the other one is the cutting edge of the scimitar. What he does, what he will do, is combine these three paintings into one. Let me show you how. You take these two women at the threshold, at the entrance of a turbe. This is the turbe of Sidon the first. Erase the women, and take the two guys from the scimitar place them there, and you have a little space left where you can conveniently put the turtle trader. Photoshopping. It looks ridiculous. This is a sketch. <laughs> this is an undated sketch that is preserved in his family of some kind of amusing with the idea of combining these three paintings into one and creating a totally different, and if he had had time to create this painting, people would have been wondering what is the symbolism behind the combination of these things. That's how he works. It's photoshopping. It's good old photoshopping and works fine. So, in a more uh, 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 general way, let me show you how this works. 
1908, the scimitar vendor, look at the little shield. This is the shield that you see in the 1880 painting. This is the shield that you see on his photograph in 1873. And this is the shield that he stole, in fact, from the exhibit at the Vienna exhibition. Look at the helmet. The helmet you will find in the 1888 painting of the King of Constantinople, but it's also in the 1880 painting. Look at that turban. It is, of course, the turban of the 1873 exhibition, but it is the turban of the um, of the Persian vendor. It is the turban of the turtle charmer. The coffee pot. The coffee pot you can see in 1888. The coffee pot is already in 1880, standing on the ledge. So. Everything, the Iznik plate, the vase, the helia, these descriptions of the prophet, the helia you can find here, there, and of course in the turban. All these elements, the, uh, the, the candlestick, the candlestick is there. It's also there with his son. So this is how he works. This is how he works. This is how he sees these Islamic objects as objects that authentify his art and that are extremely handy when it comes to uh, um, distributing on, on painting. So now let's come to blasphemy. Blasphemy, of course, what we've seen to this point is already a form of blasphemy, what we think about. But blasphemy is something that you find in his letters from time to time. Again, proof, written proof. My sincere, th uh, sincere thanks for the happiness. Merci pour les gens bons. Uh, to Karl Ruhmann in 1887. Uh, My wife, who loves this delicacy, asked me to hand out his wife is French. But he eats the hands too, and we see thanks for hands in practically every other letter he writes to Ruhmann. Point one in blasphemy. Je vous prie, uh, would you kindly pay my wine account with Mr. Muller before you leave? Port, wine. And references to pantheism. <laughs> Thank the gods of the Olympus and to all their, oh, sorry for the eye, uh, successors, I feel better today. That's his way of thanking God. It's half jokingly, but obviously, I mean, he's a modern. He is an atheist, I will not say it, but he is somebody, he's an agnostic, he's whatever. But that's blasphemy. But the real blasphemy in his art is this famous painting. This painting which people have called the Mihrab because there's a Mihrab. They could have called it the woman. There's a woman. But um, they call it the mihrab because they didn't know what it was called. I know what it was called because it was exhibited. It was exhibited in 1901 in Berlin under the French name of Genèse. Genesis. That's a heavy word. Genesis. So what's in this that refers to Genesis? People had already an inkling about this. It's the fact that the woman has a slight belly. It's like pot belly. She's pregnant. She's pregnant in her third, fourth month. She's pregnant. But of course, the blasphemy is elsewhere. Blasphemy is in the mihrab, in the fact that she is sitting on a rahle, on a lectern, on a Quran lectern, her, her back to the mihrab. And of course, the mihrab is the good old mihrab that we know from Karaman, which is still at the museum, which he used a photograph to represent in his painting. So you know, he had it handy at the museum, but he used photographs too. So that's blasphemy. But the real blasphemy is, of course, 